Well, these are the other bones that are so remarkable. The syncecrum is, and then the coracoid. Even humans are said to have coracoid bones. There, there are little processes that come off our scapula called the coracoid process. But no creature, and that includes dinosaurs, have coracoid bones like you see in a bird. I have another bone that he brought up he, when he said that only birds have the avian type of coracoid. And can you explain how it, it is it the, the avian coracoid significantly different from that of other dinosaurs? So this is kind of um, yeah a very a very similar line of argumentation. Um, so the coracoid, for, the, for those people who don't know, it's a, a strut-like bone in birds that connects the shoulder region to the sternum, and it's there are two kind of forming a V. The the um, the wishbone or furcula is connected to the front of the the coracoid. So we're talking about a strut-like bone that's arranged kind of you know in the shoulder region. I'm proving it, I'm being very bad at getting myself on camera when I'm trying to explain these things. Um, the Typical condition for reptiles, and again, this is inherited by dinosaurs early in the evolution, the coracoid is a kind of rectangular plate. But once you get into more bird-like theropods, and in particular get towards manoraptorans, this, this group I mentioned that includes velociraptors and so on, um, the coracoid changes to a kind of crescent-like shape. And then as in the evolutionary tree, you get closer to modern birds, this crescent type shape actually elongates and you end up with a strut-like bone, which has got two or three bony um, knobs at its top end, at the, the shoulder end. And this is where the supracoracoideus muscle, a tendon, loops through it across the top of the coracoid and attaches to the top of the humerus and is involved in elevation of the wing. So he was he was again talking about comparing, you know, saying that theropods have got one configuration and birds have got another and that they're in completely distinct, you know, boxes. Whereas in actual fact, in the fossil record, you, you see exactly what you would expect if evolution actually happened. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you see exactly, you know, what did happen. You see the coracoid changing from the ancestral reptilian, you know, subrectangular form to this crescent-like form, to this strut-like form, to the modern bird form. Um, in fact, the the changes that you would get in the coracoid to get from an ancestral theropod configuration to a modern bird configuration, this was all predicted in um, 1976 by John Ostrom, the famous scientist who named Deinonychus, that's the animal that's called Velociraptor in Jurassic Park, who was responsible for the, the dinosaur renaissance, for you know making dinosaurs in interesting animals for paleontologists and biologists. And um, what Ostrom predicted has now been found within the last 30 years in the fossil record, you know, mostly in um, eastern China. You have all these, all these fossil birds that show this almost perfect um, um, sequence of the coracoid changing into the modern avian configuration. And so, then yeah. the archaic birds didn't have the same coracoid structure that the modern birds had again. That's right, yes. So if you go, again, you know, he's quite happy to have Archaeopteryx as a bird, and yet Archaeopteryx has got uh, an ancestral configuration for the coracoid, where it is essentially just a, a crescent-shaped bone. So you, you've got that configuration in the earliest birds that even creationists are prepared to accept as birds. So when he says that, that, that dinosaurs don't have the avian coracoid, he, he should have said Archaeopteryx doesn't have the avian <laughs> coracoid. <laughs> He should have. He should have. Now, in fact, there's all, all of these different aspects of anatomy. The fact that the earliest birds, animals like Archaeop Archaeopteryx, the fact that the Archaeopteryx and its relatives are so similar to Velociraptor and its relatives and so similar to other kinds of theropods, um, that means that any creationist claims that birds fit into a separate you know, box from these theropods can be refuted on any aspect of anatomy. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's a there's a technical paper uh, published by Phil Center in, in 2010, where he he did it, he used the method that creationists have used to test the uh, anatomical closeness of animals to one another. And he showed how if you're gonna accept Archaeopteryx as a bird, then you have to have Velociraptor and other Manoraptorans as birds. And if you're gonna have those animals as birds, 
well then what about the therizinosaurs you know another group of like big feathery dinosaurs and then if you're going to accept those as birds what about the ostrich dinosaurs the ornithomimids and then if you're going to accept those as birds and you have to if you're going to keep with the logic well then what about tyrannosaurs and if you're going to accept tyrannosaurs as birds well then what about allosaurs and so on and so forth because obviously in keeping with the fact that evolution has really happened the members of these groups are you know very close to one another once you start looking at the early members of the groups once you have enough anatomical information they're showing in blue here what they are are bony struts that extend from the sternum just like we have a sternum to be from the top of the sternum up to the shoulders and those bones are capable of swinging like this and that swing is controlled by a spring and the spring uh, is the uh, wishbone right here. So when the powerful muscles make the wings go up and down, and by the way, the wings are not attached here. This is the shoulder blade, very thin on a bird. When the wings go up and down, there's tremendous force here. And if you didn't have these bony struts to hold the shoulders, the shoulders would move about. See, in our body, the only bony attachment of our arm to the rest of our body is through our collarbone. <laughs> that wouldn't work very well for having powerful muscles to fly with. Uh, the flight muscles of a bird, the muscles that make the wings go up and down, can be about 20%, uh, uh, 20 to 40% of the total body weight of the bird. Uh, compare that to the skeleton. The skeleton is so light in a bird, it makes up about 5% of the body weight. So uh, the big muscles for flight are right here in the chest. Uh, notice the sternum is very broad, and you have this keel that the flight muscles are attached to. And let's look at those muscles from the front in a diagram. Notice there's two layers of muscle attaching to the sternum. And these two layers of muscle you call breast meat when you buy the meat for chicken. And if you take fresh meat before it's cooked, you can get your hand in there and separate the two layers. Even after it's cooked, you can often pull the two layers of the breast muscle apart. One of those muscles moves the arm down. That's the outer one, and that's called the pectoralis muscle. It's just like our pectoralis major muscle. I could rip off my shirt and demonstrate, but I'll spare you that embarrassment. Uh, so the outer layer is the pectoralis muscle, and just like in our case, when that muscle contracts, the arms come down. We call that adduct. So when uh, this muscle here contracts, it will pull the humerus, that's the arm of the wing of the bird here, Downs, that explains the wing coming down. What makes a wing go up? Muscles can only pull, they can't push. Oh, this is so neat, I should charge you $5 a piece extra just to explain this. Deep to the pectoralis muscle is another muscle called the supracoracoideus muscle. It's named after that coracoid bone, which is right next to it. That muscle is going to pull the wing up, but it's going to do it by pulling down. Now, how can the muscle pull down to make the wing go up? The same way a flag goes up on a flagpole when you pull down on the rope. The same way a sail goes up on a mast of a sailboat when you pull down on the line. What we have here is a tendon that essentially goes through a pulley, more accurately a sheave, that's made up from the junction of three different bones. The scapula, the wishbone, and the coracoid. It's called a triosseal junction because it's three bones coming together. Lubricated ring, as it were. And so when the supracoracoideus muscle pulls down, that tendon goes through that little ring, attaches to the top of the humerus or the arm, and pulls it up. So imagine a bird in flight. You ever see a pheasant take off? <laughs> Those wings are really moving. Uh, they have to be pulled up with the same force they're pulled down. Deinonychus changed us over from the conception of dinosaurs you see in the mural where dinosaurs are overgrown lizards to that these are active, Cursorial, I mean, ran around for a living, you know, very much more bird-like uh, creatures, and that all stemmed from the description of Deinonychus anterophus. Well, you can just start uh, with the head. Another you know, obvious feature is rather than the teeth going underneath the orbit, it's just primitively the case in theropod dinosaurs, the entire tooth row is in front of the eyes. You know, we're eventually gonna make this into a beak. And you look at the forelimbs, you see these much longer arms. Dinosaurs start out with 
their forearms are only about half the length of their, their hind legs. I mean, think of the tyrannosaur up there with really diminutive little hands. As you get into these raptors within the theropods, they start getting these really long arms, as you can see here, that are nearly as long as the legs, with these gigantic mitt-like hands, a three-fingered hand that's fully a third the length of the entire arm. I mean, the old reconstructions, as you see here, showing kind of the limp bunny, you know, wrist attitude. But we've come to appreciate in recent years when we've got completely articulated hands, just like birds. All the motion takes place here in the wrist. They flick the hand fore and aft. And what this animal is doing is really playing praying mantis and that it's holding its arms up folded against its body. The prey item doesn't think it's as close as it is, so to speak. So they have a stereotype motion where they go down and forward, grab their prey, up and back, down and forward, up and back. That's the flight stroke. That's exactly the way birds fly today. And we always wondered, well, how do you get power on the upstroke? They actually make this transformation in a muscle called the supracoracoideus that shoots the arm forward. And in birds, it actually lifts the arm up. But the motion made here is exactly the flight stroke. So these guys are grabbing prey items a considerable distance from their body. The prey item struggles in their grasp. And as a consequence, they stabilize the shoulder joint by fusing the two clavicles together to make a wishbone. And then they have to pull the prey back to them. There's power on the upstroke before you're flying. And so virtually all details of the flight stroke originate before flight. And that's the best part about the fossil record. There's no way you'd look at a flying bird to dangle. Obviously, that forelimb came from a raptorial organ used to seize and secure prey. No way you would guess that. That's the only the information you can get from the fossil record. And birds can really fly. Uh, they're nothing quite like a bird. Uh, a swift, I'm told, at least some species of the swift, and boy, what a perfect name for this bird, a swift is capable of reaching approximately 110 miles an hour in level flight. And a, uh, uh, some of the uh, diving raptors, uh, like the peregrine falcon, I've read that a peregrine falcon has been clocked at speeds as high as 240 miles an hour on a dive. Uh, these are not dinosaurs, my friends. I hope this is getting to be obvious. What fallacious logic. That's like saying that dolphins swim faster than any other mammal, so they must not be mammals. Do you see how stupid you sound when you say things like that, Dr. Menton? You may as well say that mammals can't fly, but bats can fly, so that means that bats aren't mammals either. That's what the ignorant primitives who wrote your Bible thought. Just one more reason why you shouldn't trust man-made mythology. And once upon a time, hundreds of years ago, it did seem like there was a clear division between birds and reptiles. But dinosaurs have since closed that gap. They are a series of transitional species that you're still trying to deny. And nothing illustrates that transition, either from reptiles to birds or from dinosaurs to birds, better than Archaeopteryx, which you call a bird and not a dinosaur. Every characteristic that you say identifies Archaeopteryx as a bird has been found in non-avian dinosaurs. It's much more dinosaur than bird because it meets all of the dinosaur criteria, but it doesn't possess any of the exclusively avian criteria that you've talked about so far, not even the fully avian coracoid. You're being inconsistent, Dr. Menton. And more importantly, you're wrong. And you have been wrong on every single criteria that you pretend to distinguish between birds and dinosaurs. You know you're wrong on every point and that you have no defense, but you're forbidden to admit that because you work for a multi-million dollar propaganda mill that pays you to misrepresent the facts and make believe things that are not really true. You took an oath that you would defend the faith regardless what the truth is and that you would never admit when any important point has been proven false. You're a professional liar, Dr. Menton. Birds are definitely dinosaurs, even according to your own criteria. <laughs> 